Good morning. I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to welcome each of you to our Sunday morning worship service. And as you can tell by all the enthusiasm and excitement this morning, uh, after that big ball game yesterday, everybody's uh, excited and it just puts you all in a good mood for Sunday morning worship service. And I know our, our speaker of the hour will have on that bright blue Kentucky bow tie this morning. <laughs> if you're visiting with us, we're happy to have you and we invite you to uh, fill out an attendance card located on the back of the pew in front of you. And uh, please pass it down the outside aisle and they'll be picked up in a few minutes by our ushers. On our prayer request, uh, Vicki Smith, the wife of Alan Smith, uh, is home from a stay in the hospital. Uh, she is still having uh, stomach trouble. Denise Knuckles, uh, knee surgery on Thursday went well, and she will go to rehab soon. Please remember Carol Cummings. Uh, she is in the hospital here in Henderson. And we extend our deepest sympathy to Miranda Bogus and family on the loss of her mother, uh, Darlene Arnett. The funeral is today at 2 p.m. at Brown Funeral Home in Mayfield. In other activities, if you didn't have uh, get a chance to fill out an involvement form last week, we still have them available in the lobby. And there's a container you can put those uh, forms in after you get them filled out. Uh, this afternoon from 1.30 to 2.30, there will be a wedding shower for Brock Wilkerson and Riley Dixon uh, in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, the couple is registered at Amazon and Target. The fourth and fifth grade uh, Devo will be this evening in the Fellowship Hall following the evening services. And we are collecting candy to stuff the eggs for our Easter egg hunt. There are baskets in the lobby uh, to put the donated candy. Our youth group will be meeting at the Terry's home on March 22nd from 7 to 8.30 to stuff the eggs. And the annual Easter egg hunt will be on March 23rd at 10 a.m. at the McIndoo Cabin. This is for fifth grade and under. Just bring your baskets. There will be light refreshments. And please sign up in the lobby if you plan to attend. The youth group Devo uh, will be at the home of Clayton and Mallory Kramer on March the 24th. That's all I have in the way of announcements. Uh, those privileged to lead us this morning, our opening prayer will be led by Juan Nunez. Our song leader will be Carl Powers, Lord's Supper Devo by Leland Steely. Reading our scripture will be Brad Carter, and our sermon by David Salisbury, and our closing prayer by Billy Ray. Now, if you would, join Carl in our singing.
bow with me, please. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for another day in our lives that we're able to come together, assemble together, and glorify you and give honor to you for all the blessings. For your son Jesus has came here on earth and at a time of trials and tribulation and hate and war and terrible slavery, human trafficking, he gave people comfort and hope in his message, in his words, in his actions, in the ultimate sacrifice to die on the cross for our sins. Our sins are washed away. Our debt is paid through this act and our pathway to your kingdom is through him. That the message we hear in the scripture each and every day and, and for the sermon today that we take it and build a better relationship with Christ and we become better followers, better servants, better stewards. And Father, as we are going through life, that we all have trials and tribulation. We have many on the prayer list that are suffering, those that uh, have lost loved one. And we pray for Miranda Bogus uh, and her family and the loss of her mother, to cherish the memories that bring smile to their faces, but uh, knowing that the comfort that the uh, Many are knowing that she's in heaven. We continue to pray for, for all of us as we are here in this hour to continue to uh, strengthen our faith and carry it throughout the week. We pray for those that have gone astray and, and, ho and hope for a soon return among our numbers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Have you ever noticed how older children who now care for their parents often do things for them, their parents once did for them? They frequently help with actions the parents can no longer do, actions the parents once did for the children when the children were young, too young to do them. Such actions may include cutting up a piece of meat, buttering a slice of toast, feeding them a meal, holding on to them while they take a walk, or tucking them into bed at night. Some refer to such role changes as a part of the circle of life. In some cases, adult children engage in practices or routines that reflect the influence of a parent. A child may fix a certain food the way a parent did or use the tools a parent once did to fix a car or repair something around the house. Those are ways we honor the memories of special people whom the Lord graciously brought into our lives. When Jesus established communion, he told his disciples then and now, do this in remembrance of me. We do certain actions, such as the ones described above, in remembrance of loved ones. But those are actions we try to duplicate. Our remembrance of Jesus at communion is very different. That remembrance is done not because we can ever repeat or duplicate what Jesus did, but out of gratitude that he did for us what no one else could ever do. Only Jesus, as the sinless Son of God, could offer the perfect sacrifice that was required to pay the wages of sin, which is death. The elements of communion, the bread and the juice, are symbols that remind us of the price that only he could pay. Our remembrance of Jesus, however, does not end with communion. Our actions throughout the week, even actions as commonplace as fixing our meals or using our tools, must be done to honor Jesus. As Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. The words, do this in remembrance of me, are, matched, are etched on the front of this communion table and many others. May we etch those words in our daily lives as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we gather here this morning to partake of this bread, pray, Father, that we focus our minds back to the cross in remembrance of what Jesus Christ did for us and sacrificing his body on that cross that through him we might have forgiveness of our sins. Pray, Father, that as we partake of this, we'll do so in a manner that's pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pray with Father in heaven, 
come before you again thanking you, Father, for Jesus Christ and his shed blood on that cross of Calvary. We ask, Father, that as we partake of this fruit of the vine, that we might remember it as a symbol of his shed blood and the salvation it brings to us. And these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper and as a matter of convenience, we'll take this opportunity to make our offering to the Lord. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the many blessings that you've given us. Thank you, Father, for our jobs and the ability to work. Thank you, Father, for everything that you've given us spiritually and materially. We ask, Father, that as we Make our contributions this morning that we'll do so freely and cheerfully. And the work of your church in this community and around this world might be continued. Yes, Father, that you'll continue to bless us always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
This morning's scripture is taken from Romans 5, 6 through 8. Romans 5, 6 through 8. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Brad. Thank you for being here this morning. It is good to be together. I miss my hour, but I'm glad to be here with you. If you're a Tennessee fan, we lost more than an hour last night, but that's okay because tournament's coming up and uh, it's a fun time. I do want to make mention of one thing before we jump into the lesson. Today is Bob McIndoe's 10-year anniversary as an elder, and we haven't always done a good job celebrating milestones like that, but that's a big deal. And certainly, I appreciate Bob and Rodney and the service that they offer, and those moments need to be marked. So be sure and let Bob know that we appreciate his service, and uh, Rodney's got an anniversary coming up, I believe, next month. We'll make sure and tell you about that as well. But uh, I'm grateful for the folks that give to this church in all kinds of ways, but especially as our leaders. We're kicking off a brand new sermon series this morning called The Road to Calvary. And it's got, uh, it's an Easter sermon series. If you want to look at that, it certainly has Easter in mind. We're going to take a look at the cross. We're going to take a look at the empty tomb. It's a five-part series, which uh, let me tell you a little bit, kind of step into the way I set stuff up, but... It's a five-part series, and Easter is on the fourth Sunday. So I want you to invite people to come. I want you to invite guests. For some folks, Easter is a big deal and a big day, and they're looking for a church. Don't miss that opportunity. Ask them to come. Invite them to come next Sunday and the Sunday after that. You don't have to wait till Easter, but, but if they say, hey, could I come to church with you that Sunday? By all means, absolutely, they can. It's always great to talk about the resurrection. But I've set this series up so that it kind of can help us also teach in a lot of different ways. One of those ways is if you just come on Easter Sunday, we're going to be in the middle of a sermon series. Welcome to part four of a five-part sermon series. It's not a special holy day. It's not a big show we put on just for visitors. And If you come back next week, it'll look all different. This is what we do every week. Every Sunday, God's people gather and we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know when you bring your friends there, they're going to see what we do every Sunday. We're going to sing and pray. We'll take the Lord's Supper like we do every Sunday. We'll make an offering like we do every Sunday. We'll have a lesson from God's Word. It's going to look the same. And if you have somebody who says, hey, I'll come Easter Sunday, by all means, tell them, hey, that was part four. Come back next week for part five. Or watch the previous weeks, and you'll see the same thing. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, the empty tomb, is a historical fact. You can go back and, and with historical records prove that that tomb was empty. You can prove that it happened over the Jewish holiday of Passover. That Jesus died and rose again on the third day, which was a Sunday morning. And that Sunday throughout history has been known by names like Easter, Pascha, or Resurrection Sunday. Faithful Christians celebrate Jesus and the good news of his gospel, his death for our sins, his burial in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and his resurrection. And we celebrate that every Sunday. We remember it every time we take the Lord's Supper. At every baptism, we celebrate our own death to sin and resurrection to new life as we remember what Jesus did for us. And when we gather to worship on the first day of the week, it's a reminder that Sunday is the Lord's day. It's the highlight of the entire Bible. Every passage of Scripture, every moment of history looks to that event. Many of the songs that we sing are about that moment. And so as we go through this sermon series, I'm going to take a line from a song every week. And so this week, if you're taking notes, call this one, On a Hill Far Away. It's the opening line to the song, Old Rugged Cross. On a hill far away stood that old rugged cross. And this morning, we're going to take a look at the cross, but, but we're going to look from a hill far away. I want you to know we're going to take a long distance look at the cross. And if you look at that road that leads to the cross, that road that leads to Calvary, it begins in Eden. 
It goes all the way back to the very beginning. You remember the story in Genesis of creation. Everything God made, he would make something and say it's good. And the next day he made more and he said it's good. And on days one through three, he brings order to, to the universe. And, and then on days four through six, he fills up those different areas that he has brought order to. And as he creates, he says, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. And when he gets done at the end of day six, he looks and he says, oh, it's very good. And when God says it's very good, you and I would say it's perfect. It's exactly the way he intended. And God created Adam and Eve to live in a perfect world. He brought them to the garden. He placed them in it. He gave them dominion over it. He gave them work to do. They had a God-given work to do. They had a relationship that was God-given. He played matchmaker. Adam, that she's the one for you. Eve, he's the one for you. God gave them a relationship as husband and wife that was divinely ordained. And through it all, they only had one rule to keep. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Just one rule. That's all they had. Just one rule. And the road to Calvary begins at that tree. Genesis chapter 3 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Now, that's not what God said. You and I just read what God said. He said, you can eat of any tree in the garden except that one tree. But Satan has an agenda here. He's wanting Eve. He says, hey, would you clarify God's rules for me? Can, can you go back over God's rules again? Let's revisit that. What exactly did he say? And in verse 2, Eve says to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And we say, wait, wait a minute, Eve. That's not what he said either. Hold on just a minute, Eve. That, that's not it. But you know, Eve is just helping God out. You know, I mean, after all, it makes sense, right? If you don't touch it, you can never eat from it. So it's a good rule to say, don't touch it and don't eat of it. In fact, it would have been better if God had said it that way. And, and Eve says, you know, it's kind of crazy that he left that part out. So Eve fills it in for him because God's commands are good, but sometimes he needs us to kind of explain them a little bit. And so Eve fills in the gap that God left there and says, you know what, God, I am just the person to help you out, to kind of color in around the edges. That was a good command, but let me make it a little bit better. Don't eat of it and don't touch it lest you die. And Eve has walked right into Satan's Trap, Because then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You can be your own God, he says. You don't need him to make all the rules. Because that's what God does, according to Satan. He just sits back and makes rules willy-nilly and says, well, do this and do this and don't do that and don't do that. He's kind of like a diet, you know. Oh, is that fun? You can't do it. Oh, is that hard? Do more of it. God's just back there making rules up as he goes along. Satan says that God is just a rule maker and you can do it better than he can. You should be the rule maker. Besides, the point of power is to get your own way, to do what you want. So Satan says you take that fruit and you can have the power of God. And verse 6 says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So, so here's this situation that's set up, and it becomes a pattern for sin. Eve looks, and it looks good. She says, I want it. And she takes it. Satan says, does it look good? Do you want it? Then be your own boss. Take it. Take charge. Be the one in charge. You don't have to ask anybody else's permission. If it looks good to you and you want it, take it. Don't let mean old God make all the rules. Take charge of your own life. 
Be your own God. And Satan even says, be God with your eyes wide open. Make your own decisions. You don't need him to tell you anything. And so Eve rebelled against God. And then she turned to Adam and he rebelled against God as well. And verse 7 says, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Oh, sin does open your eyes, but it only opens your eyes to your own shame. Adam and Eve had their eyes open. All of a sudden they understood good and evil, right and wrong, and they knew they were in trouble as well. They were ashamed and they, caught to, they sought to cover their shame. Their sin broke their relationship with God, but even before that, it broke their relationship with each other because they had made a promise to keep their word to God. And now they both realized, hey, we can't trust each other to keep our word. And if we can't trust each other to keep our word to God, how can we trust each other to keep our word to each other? And suddenly their relationship changed. And the shame that they felt changed their relationship to each other. And they sought to do anything they could to cover up their shame. And then it gets worse. In verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They rebelled and then they ran. Oh no, here he comes. They could hear God walking toward them and they hid from God. Maybe he won't know. Maybe he won't find out. Maybe he, maybe he won't even miss that one fruit. Maybe we can get away with it. Oh, but he knew. He'd already found out. They weren't going to get away with it. And in verse 9, the Lord God called to the man, to Adam, and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. You can't hide from God. You can't hide what you've done from God. They tried to run away from God, and he came looking for them. It's too late when they learn what they've done. Their shame of rebellion has now caused them to run. And if you skip down just a little bit, go down to verse 16, there are some consequences now. God said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. God said, I gave you guys a job to do. One of your jobs was to, to have a family, to multiply and he said, that's going to be more difficult now. It's going to hurt more. Family's going to be more difficult. And then that God-given relationship, that husband and wife pairing, that completing of one another that he had designed, it won't work like it did before. It's no longer a perfect team helping each other. Instead, you'll vie for control. You'll want to desire to control him. He's going to desire to rule over you. Life is going to be harder now. Family and marriage is going to be harder now. He goes on in verse 17 and said to the man, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you'll struggle to scratch a living from it. It'll grow thorns and thistles for you. Though you will eat of its grains, by the sweat of your brow you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Adam, your work's going to be harder now. Family and marriage, it's going to be more difficult now as a consequence. Work is going to be harder now. That ground that originally produced fruit and vegetables for you... Now it's going to produce naturally thorns and thistles. Weeds are going to grow freely. And you're going to have to work to get something good from the ground. And your body that I created to work perfectly, it's not going to work perfectly anymore. It's going to begin to wear out and break down. And eventually you will die. These consequences of sin, they include pain and hardship, broken relationships, marriage and family and work is all going to be more difficult, horrible consequences. By their sin, they harmed themselves, their relationships, their work and their family. But you know, there was also mercy and grace there in the garden. Skip down to the end of Genesis chapter 3. It says, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden 
sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. You say, David, I thought you said there was mercy and grace here. I don't see mercy and grace. It doesn't seem like it to me. But God covers their shame at his own expense. It was his garden. Those animals were his animals. And he makes a clothing for them that was much better than the fig leaves they had tried. God covered his sh their shame in his own expense. And he allows them not to be ashamed any longer. And then he sends them out of the garden. You say, David, that sounds like horrible punishment. But look at what he says. If they now eat of this tree of eternal life, they're going to live forever in the state they're in. And he says, I want you to know, Adam and Eve, this new life, this broken life, this life where everything is hard, where things don't work the way they're supposed to, I'm not going to give that eternal life. That's not the way things will be forever. This broken life of sin is not eternal. You can look forward to a restoration to perfection. One day, we'll make right everything that's been, that sin has made wrong. One day, We'll have hope that things can be back the way they're supposed to be. Their relationships and family and work and our bodies and everything will be perfect like God intended. There is hope and it's not found in this life and in this brokenness. It's something beyond and you can look and on a hill far away, even then, you can see that old rugged cross because the road to Calvary begins right there. Because Adam and Eve's story, it's our story too. You and I are born into innocence and perfection. But it's just a matter of time, right? A, time, a matter of time until we decide to take matters into our own hands. A matter of time until we decide, hey, I, I'm going to make the rules. I doubt God's role in my life. I think power is about getting what you want. And so all of a sudden, at some point, we begin to say, you know what? I see it. I like it. I want it. And I'll take it, and I don't care who says anything different. And so we rebel. Paul says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Our actions are a rebellion. A rebellion just as surely as Adam and Eve did. Our actions are a reflection of a heart that says, I don't want to serve God. I don't want him to tell me what's right and what's wrong. I want to be in charge. And then our eyes are opened. And all of a sudden, we know good and evil in a way we never did before because now we're on the wrong side of that line and sin has separated us from God. And often our first thought is to run and hide, to run away from God, to leave church behind, to try to pretend that God doesn't see us Maybe by saying, you know what, if I don't go to church, if I don't acknowledge God, then he can't see me. We're like that little kid who plays hide and seek, right? And they cover up their eyes and they think, well, since I can't see you, you can't see me. And we do that with God somehow. If I just keep you out of my life, then you won't know what I'm doing. You won't know what I've done. And we sow fig leaves together. And we think I can fix this. I can manage this. I can get it back. But we can't. Because our lives are broken by our sin. Paul says in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. Our rebellion and our running, they end up ruining us and the consequences are awful. The consequences break us. We know Adam and Eve's story because we've lived it. We've seen those relationships broken and harmed by sin. We've seen things get harder instead of easier. We know what it's like when work seems frustrating instead of rewarding. And we've seen sin try to tear down our marriage and our family. And we know the lies of the devil. They make our work less than it ought to be and harder than it should be. We've lived that sin that separates us from God, that breaks the things in this life that we love the most. We know Adam and Eve's story because it's our story. And suddenly that hill far away, that old rugged cross becomes so important. It is the emblem of suffering and shame. But it's the emblem of my suffering and my shame and your suffering and your shame that Jesus took. Because on that old rugged cross, the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. 
And so just like Adam and Eve, we find mercy and grace. We find a God who covers our shame, who reminds us that the broken nature of sin does not get the final word. And that we don't have to live this way forever. Because Calvary is all about a restoration, a reparation. I read Romans chapter 3, verse 23. And you should know that verse. It's a powerful verse. Paul indicates that the story of sin is our common story. All of us have chosen sin. We don't have to inherit sin from Adam. We mess it up on our own. We do just fine making our own mistakes. And so all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But if you know Romans 3 and verse 23, you ought to add verse 24 to it as well. Take time to memorize that as well. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's the rest of the story. There is mercy and grace. And I told you what Paul said in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. The wages of sin is death. But you need to know the whole verse because the rest of it says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Grace and mercy are available at the cross. The road that begins in Eden that leads through heartache and heartbreak and sin and devastation, that road runs all the way to the old rugged cross because it's a universal human condition. We know what it's like to be lost in sin. We know what it's like to be covered in shame. We know what those consequences feel like. But did you know, you can know what it feels like to be loved by God even in that moment, to be redeemed from your sin, to have your shame covered and to find grace and mercy. It's what Paul meant in the reading that we had this morning from Romans chapter 5. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died he died for the ungodly. Those who might have thought, I want to be God, but found out I can't. Those who said, I want to sit on that throne, but I can't. I am not God. I am ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die, not that you and I would be that good of a person that somebody would give their life for us, but maybe somebody out there would be. But God, verse 8, demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were ungodly, while we were in rebellion, while we were broken and ashamed, while we were still sinners, nowhere close to a righteous, good person that someone might possibly dare to die for, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. On a hill far away, even though our sin and our rebellion had broken us, God offers to redeem us. So is it any wonder that we will cherish that old rugged cross till our trophies at last we lay down? I'll cling to that old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. The road to Calvary is a road that each of us must travel. There comes a moment in our lives when we have to acknowledge our shame and our sin and repent. And in that moment, in that moment when you think everything is broken and ruined beyond repair, you will find the mercy and the grace and the love of God at an old rugged cross. Because when we repent of our sins and confess our faith in Jesus as the Son of God, when we're baptized into him, his blood washes over us and washes our sins away. And we are added to the church. We're adopted as his child. We find God's faithful love. And we begin a new life. A life in Christ. A life walking with God. 
a life walking that road that leads to Calvary and beyond through the rest of our life. We are forever changed because of what God did for us on the old rugged cross. Maybe this morning it's time for you to become a Christian, to make that decision and that commitment to find God's love that is available to you today. Or maybe this morning you're a child of God. You accepted that, you made that commitment, but as you look at your life, you've gone back to sin and you say, you know what, I need to cling to that old rugged cross. It's the only hope I've got. I need to return and repent and be restored. God waits to welcome you or welcome you back. If we can help you in any way, won't you come right now as we stand and sing?
Let us pray. God, our Father, who art in heaven, how great thy name. Thank you, God, for this wonderful building we have to worship thee. Thank you for the men and women that put their self in harm's way to protect this country and all over the world and locally. And thank you for the veterans that have protected us in the past so that we might have this freedom to worship thee here. Thank you for all these wonderful young voices we hear in the audience. As we know our church is growing, this is a good sign for us all. Please be with David and his family as he helps teach the Bible to us. Be with Josh and Emily as they teach our youth. Help us all to do things pleasing to thee. Be with those that are sick and awaiting results. Help them have the good results if any way possible. And be with those that are helping do this to strengthen their knowledge, to help them more. But most of all, God, thank you for Christ, that sacrifice he made on that cross for our salvation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.